Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Fort Calhoun Station Public Meeting. My name is Linnea Wilkins. I'm one of the licensing project managers out of the headquarters office in DC, and I will be coordinating tonight's meeting. We appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules to come and listen to what these two groups have to say tonight. This meeting is being recorded, and it will be available on the Fort Calhoun Special Oversight page on the NRC website. The focus of tonight's meeting is the safety of Fort Calhoun. We're not going to discuss any OPPD financial business or any fiscal matters. We are going to focus on the safety of Fort Calhoun Station. As a reminder, we at the NRC place high priority in being open to the public and informing the public of what we do and what's going on. As you came in, you see there's a, a table full of information. First, there's a public feedback form. Using this form, you can let us, the NRC, know how we're doing. We are constantly striving to improve our meetings, and we value any input you may have. Any comments about the venue, the location, the presentations, or any comments, please fill out a public feedback form. The posted, excuse me, they are posted, paid, and pre-addressed. So at your convenience, please just fill it out and drop it into your mailbox. Also on the table are note cards. We will have a question and answer session following the presentations. If you do not wish to come up and state your comment or ask your question, you can write it down on one of these note cards. Either I or one of my colleagues will collect it from you and read it on your behalf. Other information on the table are the confirmatory action letter restart checklist, as well as the meeting slides. These materials will be referenced to during the presentation and available, are available for you to follow along with during the meeting tonight. I'd also like to note that the latest inspection report dated July 16, 2013 is available on the Fort Calhoun Special Oversight webpage as well as in apps. This meeting is between the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Omaha Public Power District regarding the safety of Fort Calhoun Station. This is the latest in a series of public meetings. Previous meetings have been held here in Omaha, as well as in Blair, Nebraska, as well as headquarters in DC. The meeting summaries and videos are also available on the Fort Calhoun Special Oversight webpage. I'd now like to welcome staffers from your elected officials. We have representatives from Senator Sir Johan's office, Congressman Fortenberry's office, as well as Congressman Terry's office. We appreciate their continued interest in the safe operation of Fort Calhoun. Again, the purpose of tonight's meeting is the safety of Fort Calhoun. At this time, I'll let these two groups introduce themselves, beginning with the NRC. Tony, I'm Tony Vagel, and I'm the Manual Chapter of Oversight Panel Chairman. Yeah, I'm Lisa Lund, and I am the Vice Chair of the Oversight Panel. I'm Lisa Kay, I'm the Branch Chief responsible for Oversight of Fort I'm Hartley, Chief of Licensing for Fort Calhoun and Region 4 Plants. Craig Warnick, I'm a Senior Inspector from Region 4. I was the team leader of the last inspection. Uh, Linnea mentioned that that report was issued July 16th, and I'm here to ask a few questions that we have pertaining to the results of that inspection. My name is Jake Blumbach, I'm the President. Thank you. And now, for Calhoun Management. Mr. Kornbosky? Yeah, good evening. I'm Luke Kornbosky. I'm the Site Vice President for the Hill Station and the Chief Nuclear Officer for the PD. Good evening. I'm Mike Prospero, the Plant Manager for the Hill. Good evening. I'm Bruce Rash. I'm the Senior Recovery Manager for Fort Cal. Good evening. I am Scott Swanson, the Site Operations Director. Hello, my name's Gary, and I'm the Nuclear Oversight Manager for Fort Thank you. And just to give you a high level of tonight's agenda, the NRC will discuss the current status of the assessment activities associated with the confirmatory action level restart checklist. The forecast home management will then discuss activities to support restart. You may also hear some questions from the NRC directed towards the forecast home management during their presentation. <coughs> Following the presentation, we will take a 15 minute break and then proceed to the public question and answer portion of tonight's meeting. And this is where you will have the opportunity to ask your questions or make any comments. Again, 
There are no cards on the table, so if you don't feel comfortable or for any other reason, don't want to come up and ask your question, one of us will ask it or make your comment on your behalf. We will go until about 9 o'clock or until the question and answer portion is ended, whichever comes first. If we do run out of time and there are remaining questions, the NRC staff is available immediately following the meeting to answer any questions you may have. Again, this video is being recorded and will be available on the Ford Capital Special Oversight webpage. With that said, I'll now turn it over to Tony Bagel, the chair of the O350 panel. Good evening. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming to this meeting. I know it's a nice sunny day outside. I appreciate it. You know, coming to the tent. Because your involvement is uh, very, very important to us. And today's meeting is a continuation of our efforts our communication with the office to give you the status of our oversight activities at Fort Health Station as well as our perspectives. Since the last meeting, which was in the May, middle of the May time frame, the NRC has conducted uh, extensive inspections since that time and we continue to do so today. There's another large team uh, currently in the middle of the inspection uh, there on site. Uh, either there last week or this week as well as next week. Our focus through all the inspections and through all the activities has been to be completely independent, to independently verify safety, to be thorough in our inspections, to thoroughly evaluate each issue to make sure that the performance deficiencies that need to be resolved are thoroughly addressed. Uh, a reflection of that is uh, Mr. Warning's inspection that we did back in the May time frame. And we had the opportunity to look at that 200-page inspection report. We uh, articulates all the issues that we looked at in documents, our assessment. I think you two will agree in looking at that report that it was a thorough evaluation. And last, but most importantly, all our inspections are inspections that are focused on operational safety. Safety today and safety tomorrow, so safety will be assured for County Station. <coughs> Since the last public meeting has been made, the O350 panel has also met on several issues evaluated the inspection results, and we have closed some of the restart checklist items. Let me kind of cover a little bit of what we mean when an issue is closed. The way the process has been developed is that we have the inspectors go out in the field, evaluate each issue, they develop an assessment, and the assessment could be that yes, the issue has been thoroughly addressed and corrective actions are placed to prevent recurrence and a recommendation to be closed. Or the inspector could say, no, they haven't done enough to fix the problem, and more actions are needed. Or the inspector could say, I need more time, I need more resources to inspect this area more thoroughly. Then the inspector would come to the O350 panel, which consists of most of the folks sitting here at the table, both representing headquarters, uh, technical staff, and even the co chair of that, and also in cases if there's a specific technical issue, we would also involve the technical experts from the agency uh, to help inform the panel that whether they're, again, doing another check to make sure that the issue is adequately addressed. And from that process, a panel could vote to say, yes, adequate action has been taken to address the issue and it can be now closed. Or that the panel would say, no, we're not quite comfortable. We, we feel that more needs to be done and that we would develop the actions and that we need to take and we would communicate to Fort Calhoun that what we feel needs to be done to fully address that issue. So it's a it's a thorough process and it does it does take some time, but it's the bottom line is that that the issues are being addressed and safety is assured. So, where are we at? I've been involved with the 
prosecutor was always up before Kaplan for about a year. And the current assessment for Burns who before Kaplan. And let me talk a little bit about our focus is to ensure the safety and simplicity of the people, the equipment, and the processes need to be in place to ensure safety. From a people perspective, we're seeing that Fort Kathleen is making some progress in addressing those issues. Case in point, in a human performance issue, that was a process to, to identify issues in that area and to affect better performance in, for, for workers, for just for that here, and in their ability for, to learn from them. So human performance in the area that they really worked on, and you see improvement in that area. In the area of the plant, or equipment. There too, we see the problems. We see the physical improvements to the plant. Um, for example, like the contained penetration, the Teflon issue. They had all been replaced, and they now just need to be retested. So that modification has been completed. Another one would be raw water pumps, which is the, the safety related <coughs> According to safety uh, service policies, in which is the releasing of Joe refurbishment with them um, and that's the tornado protection is another area where you go out and like, you see expensive modification and the put in place. We see the physical changes at the plant, which all kind of drive to the improvement of safety at Fort Campbell Station. And that's a problem. Positive and that is uh, uh, for um, tornado uh, missile protection. That is so, it, it didn't work. The physical changes have been made to the We're still looking, that there's still work needs to be done. Uh, the current uh, license amendment request that is currently under review uh, by the NRC. And lastly, processes. We see also improvement in that area, or progress. In the corrective action program, we see improvement in the area of, of the implementation of the corrective action program, especially in the area of identification. We, there's been a marked change, but if I look at it over a year, there have been changes, there's problems. So, bottom line, we're seeing improvement, we're seeing progress. Is the, is the, is the plan ready to you know, restart today? Done. As Mike will talk about shortly going through the other area, there's still more work needs to be done, but we are seeing some progress in that four county is addressing the important areas that, that really have a tie to so the operational safety. Um, four county still has work that needs to be done, and so does the, the NRC. And uh, now I'll turn it over to Mike that he's going to walk us through the restart checklist and going through the specific area that we, we looked at that we identified needs to be addressed and where we're at from the uh, inspection perspective. So that Mike. Thanks, so. <coughs> well, good evening and, and again thanks for everybody for coming out here tonight. You know, since December of this year, we've performed numerous inspection activities. It's hard to tell you how many teams because uh, we've had different groups of teams come out here, but we put them in one report, and so this, you know, but I can tell you there's been about 60 inspectors that have been out here that have, been, that have made up approximately six or seven different types of teams. And, and we've covered the majority of the areas that are in the research channels. And as Tony said, you know, there's a number of areas that we've looked at and we found them adequate. However, there is also a number of areas that more work is needed. You know, we'll be waiting for the licensing to complete that work, and then we'll follow up with the NRC inspections. Now the thing is on the slides. Next slide, please. So, I'd like to go through the research checklist. I'm going to go through each item in the checklist provide a real brief discussion on, on what, what that area is, and then provide a uh, brief 
discussion on where we're at with our inspection and assessment too. The, the, the first area in the research check is what, I guess we, before I start talking about the specifics, I, I would like to say just, to, just to so everybody understands, the, the restart checklist is, is, is broken up into different sections. And sections one through four of the restart checklist comprise those areas or items that the licensee is responsible for evaluating and looking at the results of those evaluations and taking whatever actions are appropriate based on the results. And then further on in the research checklist areas five and on, those are areas that are specific NRC related activities that, that we are doing. Uh, some of them we're doing right now, a few of them we'll do towards the very end. Uh, but in general, the inspection activities that the NRC is performing are remaining in section five. So the purpose of my discussion tonight is to go through sections one through four and, and, and section five. So with that, section one deals with the, the causes of the significant safety and security issues that we identified at the site. And because there was a number of safety and security significant issues, the NRC wanted the licensee to also perform an integrated organizational effectiveness assessment and an overall safety culture assessment. The purpose of those assessments was to understand what led to the decline in performance and, and to basically use the results of those assessments to change uh, those deficiencies. So section 1A, or item 1A, dealt with the yellow finding. And that, that yellow finding involved inadequate flood mitigation uh, strategies that we're at the site to deal with the design basis flood. The NRC has performed extensive inspections in this area. The bottom line is the, the specific uh, issues that were of concern that resulted in the finding have been corrected. However, there are still some activities that are related to the design basis flood that are being looked at. For example, there are some modifications done uh, to, to basically um, mitigate the design basis flood and, and it's you know we're still reviewing the adequacy of that modification so this area remains open for that reason I would like to say though you know the, the licensee is taking actions like I just said to modify the plan uh, to establish a strategy that will be better strategy that the plan was originally built. In addition to that, the licensee is also developing and putting in place strategies to mitigate the consequences of a flood that would be beyond this basis. So that would be above and beyond what, what the currently required for production is. So we, we are looking at all of those activities on With respect to one Bravo, that dealt with the failure of the reactor protection system. Again, the licensee adequately corrected the specific problems that resulted in that reactor protection system failure. We still do have some open questions that were related to the uh, contributing causes that the licensee identified resulted in the problem, uh, just to understand that those contributing causes were adequately addressed. And those those would be more captured in long-term uh, type of actions that we would expect the licensee to take care of. But that issue is pretty close to being ready for the foreclosure. With respect to item one, Charlie, that dealt with the fire that occurred in the 480 old uh, electrical safety uh, system. And again, the licensee has implemented adequate corrective action address the specific causes that resulted in the fire. And they've also identified and corrected the causes that resulted in that fire not only affecting one bus, but propagating multiple buses. The reason 
this area is still open is because we are currently reviewing the adequacy of the original design of the system and ensuring that it's, that it's still safe. Uh, we, we had a team of inspectors on site this week that are finalizing that assessment. And, uh, and so we ought to be able to make our conclusions on that in a relatively short period. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Item 1 Delta dealt with a, a number of greater than green security type issues. As most of you recall, uh, there was two team inspections that had, that, that had to uh, resolve these issues. The first team inspection uh, did not go so well, and the items did not go Licensee took a lot of actions. Uh, they came in with some outside expertise and they did a thorough evaluation of the whole security department, identified a number of short term and long term actions that, that are being implemented to significantly improve the overall health of that department. And based on, based on all of that, uh, the NRC has determined that that, that area is, is adequate. Items 1 Echo and 1 Fox Drive, 1 E and 1 F, uh, those deal with the assessments that the license performed, dealing with the integrated organizational effectiveness and the safety culture assessment. We reviewed the uh, techniques that they used to do those assessments, <coughs> and we reviewed the, the results, and we reviewed the method by which the licensee was going to use those results to take action to address any of the uh, uh, negative outcomes that, that came from those assessments. And, and uh, we determined that the licensee did a good job in not only assessing those areas, but in taking appropriate actions to improve performance, not only today, but for the future. So those areas are also respect to 1G, 1 Golf, <clears throat> that, that area dealt with a, a number of safety system functional failures that resulted in a light performance, uh, performance indicator. And right now that, that area is still open. There are a, a number of uh, safety system functional failures that are still being reviewed by the licensee and, and, and therefore we have to wait until those reviews and corrective actions are corrected uh, are implemented so that we can follow up with our inspection. So that area is for me. Section two dealt with <coughs> flood restoration and the adequacy of system structures and components to support and restore. Uh, you know, back in the uh, 2011 time frame there, there was a flood and, and so a lot of these activities here uh, verify that, that the impacts of that flood did, uh, did not impact the ability of the uh, of This area is, is pretty much completed. There's only a few items left for the licensee to complete and for us to follow up with our inspection activities. So uh, you know we're we're pretty close to closing this. There's just with respect to item 2 Bravo, that, that item there deals with the, you know, looking at each of the safety systems that are important for plant restart and operations. Uh, if, if you look at this section, there's like 27, you know, 27 specific items that deal with NRC reviewing each of these systems. Uh, currently, probably completed I think, in the neighborhood of five or six. Uh, so, we, so we have a significant amount of inspection activity that's related to this area. Um, some of the things that's, that's causing us delay is the, there's a couple of areas that deal with system health, such as equipment service life that we'll talk about later, that the licensee is still completing some actions. And so, so this area still remains open uh, because there's still actions that the licensee will be taking to keep uh, restoring these systems. Item, let me try to get 
the one to Charlie now, which is the next slide. Charlie deals with the uh, qualification of entertainment, electric penetrations. Uh, probably a lot of you I, I recognize that in the previous meetings and we've had discussions that the licensee I, I identified about a little bit a year ago that there were a number of containment penetrations that, that could be, uh, uh, well, they, they were degraded. They, they could have been affected by a design-based accident and resulted in an uh, impact on the integrity of the team. And the good news is the licensee is replacing all of those penetrations. As a matter of fact, they are currently all in place. And we're just finishing up on our inspection activities now uh, to, to validate that, that those are acceptable uh, uh, actions. Testing that goes with the replacement of those penetrations. So that's that's a that's a complete uh, success story where the licensee has, has completely changed out those and the plant is in good shape from that perspective. With respect to containment internal structure, the licensee has completed an analysis that the NRC is currently reviewing. Uh, this is a very complex issue, and we've got a number of experts from two regions and headquarters that are reviewing the licenses uh, analysis. And I would say we're, we're probably going to have some more discussions on this area because it is complex. And, and you know, the, the bottom line is we're in the job of ensuring that safety is one of the more challenging issues and, and we are giving it a thorough, thorough review. With respect to section three, this section deals with the, the adequacy of significant programs and processes at the site. And the, the first area is item 3A, which deals with the corrective action process. You know, we've, we've talked about this process before. You know, this is one of the most critical processes that the licensee relies on uh, to ensure that the licensee can effectively identify, evaluate, and resolve the problems that are identified. And as you probably heard during the previous meetings, uh, you know, we, we've had a number of, of issues in this area, specifically related to the, the uh, manner by which the licensee has been evaluating and resolving the problems that enter the process. And I guess to put a little more uh, detail to that, we see the majority of challenges with resolving problems, with resolving specific problems in the area of engineering, uh, specifically related to uh, design basis type issues, you know, looking back at, at, at what what was the original design of the plan. And we're also seeing that there's some challenges with respect to the engineering department effectively understanding you know, what are the requirements, what, what are the requirements that, that need to be met in order to ensure that system structures and components can adequately perform their safety functions. So the, the bottom line in, in this area is are still reviewing uh, the corrective action process. We are not saying that this process is ineffective. Um, we are seeing that the licensee is using it. They are entering a lot of items into it. And they are, you know, fixing a lot of problems successfully. But definitely in the areas that I spoke about, more work is needed. And right now we're, we're working to understand what actions is the licensee planning to take to address those, those areas, not only in the short term, but in the long term. With respect to Area 3 Bravo, which is equipment design qualifications, uh, this area is, is broken up into a couple of different segments. The first segment deals with the licensee's ability to uh, appropriate 
appropriately uh, work on safety-related equipment and ensure that when they do that, that they use qualified parts and qualified processes to work on that equipment. Additionally, this area involves the licensee looking at the areas in the plant where you could have to have a high energy line break, which would create a harsh environment in the given area. And therefore there would be certain pieces of equipment in those areas that would need to perform functions. And so we're reviewing the environmental qualifications of that of that harsh environment. Uh, currently the licensee is completing their high energy line break analysis and we're completing the environmental qualification uh, packages that go with the equipment in those areas. And so there is more NRC inspections that can take place and those activities are. With respect to item three, Charlie, this area is dealt with design changes and modifications. Uh, this area was also broken up into a couple of sub-areas. Sub the first area deals with the vendor modification control process. Uh, in essence, what this means is when the licensee uh, modifies the plan, sometimes they bring in a third party that has the expertise to make these changes. And there's been a, a number of modifications where the control of these activities uh, has been thorough enough and has resulted in, in my problems. So, this issue here is, is still being reviewed by, by the licensee. And so in, in, until those actions are done, you know, we will wait until we follow up with our inspection activities. This area is also uh, a subpart of this area is the 5059 process. Now the, the 5059 process is a is a process that, that is actually a requirement. And it it describes how licensees can make changes to their facility. And when they make these changes, whether or not the changes require an NRC review and approval prior to uh, those being accepted the changes. We've, we've had a number of, of, of issues in this area uh, for those that, that have been following up with the inspection uh, reports and probably read that there's issues. Again, the, the real uh, genesis behind a lot of these 5059 problems is, is the licensee having a, a, a good design basis that they can use to make these changes. And, and it's also having the people that are properly trained and understand the requirements for, for making these changes and determining if there are students who can approve to be required to the changes happen. Prior to the changes. So this this area here remains open, uh, you know, basically pending the licensee completing the vendor mod control area and also pending us getting a understanding on what they plan to do in the short term and long term to the present. With respect to free delta that deals with maintenance programs. This area uh, consists of the licensee ensuring that vendor manuals and vendor information is updated. And it also deals with what we call uh, the equipment service life issue. And equipment service life basically means you've got equipment in the plan, you've got to establish the appropriate preventative maintenance on that equipment so that obviously when it's all upon function that you can have if you can perform that function. Uh, the licensee I identified that this program uh, was not being run effectively and they are addressing a significant number of uh, activities to not only get the equipment back to where it should be, but also to address the programs that resulted in, in the uh, problems. So there's still a lot of activity remaining for the licensee to complete. <coughs> uh, 
Item 3, ECHO, deals with the operability process. Uh, this process basically deals with when a graded or non-performing condition is identified at the facility. The licensee evaluates those deficiencies to understand that even though the, the, the condition exists, can the piece of equipment still perform its safety function? This area still remains open. And again, it kind of goes back to having a good understanding of the design basis and having the people trained and, and, and efficient and understanding how to use that design information in order to assess possibility. So we're still waiting to understand what are some of the short-term and long-term actions that the licensee plans to put in place to address this process. Item 3, Foxtrot, deals with the quality assurance process. Uh, QA is an is a independent oversight group at the site that basically perform functions similar to what the NRC does, where they, they watch activities being performed at the site and determine if they're, if they're being done appropriately. You know, we, we talked a while back about uh, this process by and large, there's been significant improvements in this area, and therefore this area has been closed. With respect to item four, uh, that deals with the licensee developing what's called an integrated performance improvement plan. This is on the docket, and it basically describes the, the areas that not only are in the research checklist, but additional items also. And it's the basic framework that the licensee is following to not only improve performance to, to uh, demonstrate that we're safe to restart, but it's also something that we carry forward after we start to, to basically continue to demonstrate or to continue to ensure that, that there is sustained improvement. So those, those basically make up areas one through four. And, uh, and so now I'd like to talk about Section 5. Let me get it for the So Sections 1 through 4, as we discussed, are those sections that the licensee has to perform different types of analysis and evaluations followed by the NRC inspection. Section 5 basically are those key areas that the NRC wants to verify that the licensee is, 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 is adequate. They're, they're basically you know, fundamental areas that, that we have to validate or are being run properly so that if they're not, we can take actions now and, and, and that's, that's the whole purpose of Section 5. So the first area is 5 alpha and that deals with the, the overall area of Design. And as we talked about, you know, there's a number of, of, of design uh, issues that, that we're dealing with. And, and so I'm not going to go any further in, in discussing those again. But, but the, the big picture here is we're looking to see what are the long term actions that the licensee is going to take to address the design basis type of issues. With respect to 5 Bravo, which is human performance, the the licensee did a, a very thorough assessment of, of what human performance uh, activities have resulted in declining performance. And they've taken a number of, of actions to address those, those deficiencies. And based on, based on our review of this area, we found that those uh, activities were adequate and were closing this area. With respect to 5 Charlie, which deals with quality. Um, this area remains open mainly for one area, and that deals with the quality of procedures in the operations uh, department, uh, specifically related to the quality of the abnormal operating procedures and emergency operating procedures. Uh, we, you know, we've identified a number of issues in those 
and the licensees identified it. <coughs> More, more NRC inspection is needed to ensure that, that these procedures are, are properly addressed prior to the start, and, 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 and also that whatever you know, emergency procedures are needed during plant operations are added. So, so basically what we're looking for here is, is to do more inspections and to understand what the licensee plans to do to address both the short-term and long-term. Area uh, by Delta deals with equipment performance. You know, this, this area kind of ties into item uh, in section uh, two Bravo, which deals with the system health we use. You know, part of understanding if the equipment can perform its function is, is looking at all these systems, uh, you know, and, and making sure that, that, that the systems can perform as you do. So this site remains open uh, pending completion of, of those inspections and, and some others that are specifically in five. With, with respect to configuration control, uh, this area here is, is going to be focused on during heat up activities when we have a, a team of operations inspectors on site. And that inspection will, will be watching how the operators control the plant, how they ensure that, that when equipment is being manipulated, that they maintain the uh, proper design. So this area here is open pending future NRC inspections. Five box drop deals with emergency response. We've done a number of emergency preparedness type inspections at the site. And, and we look at the licensees evaluations where they identified a, a number of areas that, that would be improved in this area. And we found that the licensees actions were, were very thorough and comprehensive and therefore we're closing this area. Additionally, in the areas of occupational and public radiation safety, we've done a number of inspections in these areas and found that, that they are adequate and ready for closure. And then in the area of security, as we've already discussed, we've had a number of team inspections and, and concluded that the overall area of security has been effectively has been effectively addressed, and therefore this area is closed. Oh, okay, that completes my discussion, and now I'd like to turn the uh, discussion back to the Let me uh, summarize, we might go into a lot of areas that need to be assessed, and even those the specific areas, that, um, some areas that we would look at. Just to give it an overall summary. So there's 18 restart checkers on it that core testing has to address for four days. Out of those 18, four, we have one good profit evaluated and both good. Security, third party audit, the group organizational assessment, and quality assurance. So that leaves 14 items remaining. So for those 14 items, all the 14 inspection permit products. And those 14 are in various stages. There are sub that we're still looking at various stages, on the right now, or there's others, like for example, blood recovery plan or game penetration that physical action is complete for the on those, those. But they're not done. <coughs> we want to make sure that every one of the items is addressed. And for, the, for, that, for that item, we'll go through the inspector, we'll complete their inspection, and then make a recommendation and go through the new process with the over 50. So, in a nutshell, issues are being addressed. There's 
still a lot of money in each of the items are, are being worked on when they work it out and we're also independently when it's their job that they're pleased with it independently when they're allowed to do So but with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Portapasi at uh, both of you and they will be uh, discussing their recovery plan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bagel. Again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We do appreciate these continued opportunities in the public forum to provide an update on the substantial progress we made at the Fort Calhoun Station. I mean, the introduction of the Fort Crossing at Fort Calhoun Station site Vice President, Chief of the Officer for OPD. To my right is Mike Ross Farrell, our plant manager. To his right, Bruce Brash, our senior recovery manager. To his right, Scott Swanson, our operations director. And it's important for us to hear from Scott tonight, not only the significant amount of work that's been completed, but how his operators are ready for plant restart. And then finally, at the end of the table, Carrie Eman, our nuclear oversight manager. I also do want to acknowledge the men and women from Fort Calhoun Station, as well as Exelon and OPP who are in the audience, as well as those that are safely at the plant tonight. Our topics for discussion, We'll emphasize the recovery actions that have been completed under the headings of people, process, and plant, tied to the progress towards restart. I'll also provide an overview of post-restart commitments under a post-restart plan for sustained improvement. And we'll hear from our nuclear oversight manager on what they're monitoring and assessing with respect to our improved performance. As highlighted in previous meetings, the foundation for making and sustaining our improvements begin with organizational effectiveness and safety culture. And as noted, we continue to monitor and adjust and grow as a team as well as an organization in this area. We're not going to spend as much time on that, but recognizing that the improvements we made start with that very strong foundation. So we'll emphasize tonight on problem identification and resolution, but we have found and fixed issues with a bias towards fixing the plant with numerous examples. We'll also have an update on the interim actions we've taken to strengthen our design and license basis control. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Mike Prosper, our plant manager. Thank you, Lou. Good evening. I am Mike Prosper, the plant manager at Fort Cameron Station. As we progress towards restart of the station, we remain focused on our site priorities. Our industrial safety and human error rate are currently ranked in the first quartile of the U.S. Safety and Power Projects. This is a tremendous accomplishment we've completed over the last year. <laughs> we developed and implemented a strategy that includes accountability-driven expectations to maintain our goal of excellence. These expectations include rigorous work planning, discipline, accomplishing work, required procedure adherence, more supervisors and managers in the field monitoring the work our workers perform. To further solidify our performance and maintain our position among the best, we have established a human performance oversight committee. The oversight team consists of senior managers and department designees. This committee meets weekly to report out on them on their department's progress and performance maintaining focus on new performance strategies, including performance monitoring, training, and communication. Our safety and new performance clearly supports that we are ready for restarts. As we prepare for restart, operational focus has strengthened throughout the organization. Industry best practices have been incorporated into our operational decision-making procedure. This process involves a multi-disciplined team and is used to develop safety-focused and thorough recommendations. The process includes development of potential solutions, advantages and disadvantages for each solution, and delivers a safety-focused safety recommendation on thorough input. The operator training being refreshed and focus on the complexities of operating a nuclear power station. Focus is being placed on reactivity control and system performance. Behaviors are reinforced and performed.
performance is being monitored using a multi-tier approach. This consists of comprehensive pre-job briefs, assessment of critical path activities, and the fast cruise process that Scott Swans, our operations director, will cover later in the presentation. All departments and staff, including the senior leadership team, utilize the Audits Control Center to accomplish work supporting the shift manager for safe operational plans. Again, we are ready for restart in this area. I get up in the morning, I call the shift manager, I call the signal. 
asked him what the client status was. First time, I'll be honest, they weren't expecting me to call in into the scene. A little bit different. And I called them my exact time when I got up in the morning. The next night, and I was actually very pleased with this, they called me in the middle of the night saying they told me twice, this is the single, this is the single. They called me to tell me I had the okay embellishment. And that meant to me, they did that, that they were doing this just like they were doing before they started this So to wrap it up, I think it's going to be moving. Past March, we did what we should be doing. We did ESF testing, and then participate in what we're going to do in the future. Is this the number one operational measures? We need to make sure that the crew, the license operators, and we're going to put everybody at the operational focus. It's been two years in transitioning over. That was so key. We'll, we'll also have our inspectors here independently verify those different evolutions as well, but that is key. Now, you're also getting help from, from the Exxon fleet as well to <coughs> That's correct. We've had uh, um, we call corporate functional area managers come in and watch ops for us. Come in and run assessments on the operating crews, they follow the operators on the grounds. And what we do is take that data, understand where our, our strengths and weaknesses are, and we adjust and uh, work on performing better as a team. Yeah. And going forward, that is built into the uh, to the oversight. Mm -hmm. Our team inspection uh, clearly observed the improved human performance here, evaluation of the fundamental performance deficiency was Consequently, we close that area. Uh, we did, however, observe that the metrics used to measure human performance did not provide meaningful data. Uh, that was primarily based on their operational condition. One of the metrics are skewed towards plan operations, as well as the coding and condition reports was such that they weren't getting meaningful data. Uh, you did state a moment ago that you're in the first quartile of human performance. How did you reconcile the observations we had? Uh, that, that showed that the, the, what you were using to measure human performance was not providing reasonable measurable data. Uh, to reach the conclusion, you just stated that uh, the metrics are showing that you're in the first quarter. You know, I'm going to use, um, you know, when you look at where we were and what we're going, obviously, as you start to admit, there's, there's, there's more risk. Uh, we all know that. You know, when I look at, uh, you know, I got to the comments, understood exactly what you and I looked at what I, what I use as a benchmark for myself, and I know Scott did too, on the ESF testing and the You line up the, basically the entire safeguard plant. And you actually run through it, cycle all your pumps on. That meant that you need to line, line the pumps up right, make sure the valves are open, make sure everything's lined up, actuate the signals at the right place. And, and they, they performed very well. I was pleased with that. I take that and look at some of the other work we're doing right now, and I, I look at if we, you know, we've re changed a whole lot. You know, we react quite a bit to these smaller issues. So we don't have any bigger issues. And I'll give you another good example. If you look at, I think it's 125,000 pounds of steel that we put up in the plant under these community listing areas. We have to drop them, we have to anybody get hurt, move that steel around. There's a lot of shots on the wall with regards to the safety aspects of that. We've done some other very risky evolutions. We're going to finish one up tonight. We're going to the intake structures, clean, clean them all up, making sure those intake structures and cells are cleaned up. So that's confined space. We do realize, just like you said, that as we start this plant up, there are going to be more critical evolutions. But the ones that we do get, the ESF testing, we've got to take advantage of them more. And utilize just what we did on this fast cruise to make sure our operators are just in time training to make sure they are properly prepared to do their jobs. Yeah, just, just to maybe hit more directly the question, we are staying on the number of the industry metrics at, at a site clock reset level, uh, which again, if you look at even events this year, um, there's been you know, significant events at stations you know, with respect to outage performance, as Mike mentioned, but the amount of work that's going on 
we not only monitor the human performance behaviors, but the industrial safety behaviors, which continue not only to uh, show good behaviors, but good results. Uh, and so with respect to the feedback about getting better data at the CR level, uh, we're getting better data, we're getting better observations, uh, better training and observations, as Mike mentioned, with the Human Performance Oversight Committee at the department levels. Uh, we see the department level human performance plans. We see how that's translated into training or appropriate. Uh, we monitor that for our you know, oversight committee uh, for training. Um, and then getting the reset data down to the crew level has probably been the biggest change since you went out. And how we're reinforcing that, and whether it's a, an RP department crew, or an operations crew, or an instrument control crew, getting it down to where the first line supervisors got. You know, measurable you know, statistics for both human performance and industrial safety was how we went back on some of that feedback. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will discuss ongoing improvements with the corrective action program. In meeting with our staff in the NRC, we have emphasized the importance of the corrective action program along with the safety, culture, and organizational effectiveness in assuring that Fort Kelly Station can effectively identify and resolve our issues, close gaps on excellence, and continuously improve our performance. Included as part of our process improvements, we have enhanced our procedures and streamlined our processes to allow the assignment of physical work items directly into the work management. This allows the organization to focus attention on actions that require engineering and design focus. The station and department corrective action review reports have enhanced training through one-on-one -on -one instruction and oral board reviews. Epsilon performance monitoring tools are implemented and new and improved performance indicators are being used to trend the corrective action program data and quality oversight. We have clearly improved in our identification and resolution of issues and the effectiveness of our review boards. Increased accountability and oversight of our safety, new performance, and corrective action program will keep us on the path to achieving and maintaining excellence. I am now going to turn the presentation over to Bruce, pending any questions. Very end of the, I guess, the, the, the corrective action program. Because that's another area that's very, very important to get that implementation. And from our inspection, what we see here, in the identification area, it could be had gotten better. In the thorough evaluation area, I think we're still looking. We're still looking at judging the performance of the So that, that would be stuff that Mike had talked about earlier. That's an area that we're still assessing. Yeah, and the indicators that we have got, we've uh, developed a nuclear oversight, all the right on. We look at our indicators that we got, it lines up in the engineering just as we discussed earlier. And then we got some departments that are performing pretty, pretty good. And they are doing, the IRP and the chemistry are excellent. The uh, online and the audits are doing pretty good. Maintenance is good. Ops is improving security. We've still got some work to do in our engineering. We we'll know it, we we'll know what areas we've got to focus. Some examples of these indicators? Yeah. One of them is the uh, Department Action Review Board uh, rejection rates. And uh, what they do, if you have too many rejections, they turn it to be uh, green, white, yellow, or red. The Station Power Proje uh, Review Board rejection rates. In other words, we got through the department said it was okay, and it came up to my level, and uh, if you could reject it. Uh, CR is overdue. Condition reports that haven't been done in a timely fashion. Our biggest areas of concern right now are the rejection rates in the uh, station car review board and the department car review board. And I'll call it our third level of analysis. We have the root causes and that, what we call problem one analysis and we call problem two. That other, that lower, that third level of tiers are an area of our concern also, especially in the engineering. Do you look at recurrence? Yes. We've got the recurrence, and that way you can line up all your windows and you know where you're at. And then some do it monthly. I uh, have the reports usually about the end of the first week, beginning of the second week for uh, July. I'll have it 
Friday, July, August 8th, and that out the one, and we just look at it, and we sit down as a team, and then we go through each individual group, so we don't understand what the indicators are, and where we need to apply additional resources. Yeah, just, just recognize that if you look at the body of work that's been done uh, to support, you know, Corrective actions and a restart. You know, I'll say a normal plan in a given year may do a maybe do a half a dozen root causes, maybe you know, two or three times that, or maybe a little more on the apparent cause level. But we're starting to see the shift now as we work through the identification of some of the significant issues, plus the work that we've done you know, through our fundamental performance deficiencies. It's allowing our capital <laughs> managers now to start looking at lower level trending. And you know, here, start to talk more about you know, common factors analysis, where we can take data points at a low level and, and arrest the trend before it has to, you know, a root cause or in some cases a parent cause has to be required. And you're just starting to see that shift as we work through you know, not only the, the, the low wave of root causes over the past year, um, but as we work with the inspectors, uh, you know, based on some feedback or um, adjustments that you talked about, Mike, Mr. Hay. Um, with respect to uh, you know, questions on is this, a, is this a contributing cause or how is this being addressed? Um, you know, we're on the, I'll say on the back end of that large, you know, that large effort that went into the analysis phase and, and is driving really the improvements and the corrective actions that we're making, both in the physical plan uh, as well as you know, the people in the process. So, with respect to looking at apparent causes, uh, most of the most recent of the inspection report uh, issued the NRC doctor number of concerns will be completeness and quality and root and apparent causes that we uh, inspected. You talk about uh, how you see the market improvement in quality of those documents. I think uh, Mr. Wingman, I um, like I said earlier, I think some of our departments are uh, some of them, as we discussed, the biggest area of our concern right now is the engineering and, uh, and the privilege of reports. Um, a lot of departments, like I said earlier, uh, the RPs and chemistry are fine. We do have some issues we've got to work through with the engineering. We've got to apply additional resources. I've just recently, in the last uh, couple of weeks, applied some additional supervision over those resources in our design engineering group and our systems and our programs. I've assigned a uh, person from our, from our staff to monitor their uh, analysis of the products that we give and how they're tracking and doing. I've also assigned and supplemented the staff with another person, one of our corrective action program managers from a few years ago, who watched the quality and closure of the condition reports that have been, that have been closed in the Let's build on that a little bit. With respect to what we talked about at the main exit, which at that time we were in the final throes of completing with industry expertise, looking again at what's the next level of performance breakthrough with respect to the corrective action program. Uh, that was an excellent product. The design and licensing basis, where we went back essentially to the start of the plant construction, uh, I believe is also an excellent product. The work that we've done on the corrective action space to look at the high energy line break, the equipment qualifications from a root cause standpoint, all contemporary products have been done in the main June, July timeframe. We believe we're all excellent products. One of the primary comments that was made by the NRC during the last inspection was that some of the contributing causes should have been looked at as root causes. In some cases, uh, our root causes have pointed at management being the cause and in some of the recent technical root causes that I've been involved with and been overseeing, they've gotten to the engineer, the reviewer, the supervisor accountability and knowledge and getting to the lower levels in the organization to make sure the design basis knowledge was there and the feedback was being given to the individual performers. Uh, the point of control for the Contributing causes, as you know, if they aren't at the level of a root cause, they don't get an extended condition, an extended cause review, we push those back down so that we can make sure that we're getting to the right causes and take your feedback seriously. I 
Thanks for that comment, Bruce. Uh, I think that's an important when you're pushing those back down. Mr. Prospero talked about focusing on the, the, the departments that are having problems. Uh, but the fact that the NRC had the observations of those root cause analyses and the parent cause analyses means that it went through your division card or went through your site corrective action review board, which means the managers on the site corrective action review board were letting those things pass through. So it sounds like, uh, from what you're saying, there's been a change at that level as well. We push those things back down to eject them when appropriate so you can provide emphasis to yes. present it to the NRC. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that allows that learning to take place at the, at the appropriate level. My name is Bruce Rash. I'm the uh, Senior Recovery Manager for Fort Calhoun. Tonight I'll give you an update on several technical topics. Uh, these are truly exciting times for us because the operations staff is starting to start systems and restore equipment. So in the area of system health review, we've done a significant amount of work at reviewing paper, at reviewing drawings, at reviewing past actions. Now that operations is starting equipment, the engineers, the operators, and the maintenance folks get to go watch the equipment run, uh, note the parameters, and make sure they're within normal values. Any that aren't are entered into the corrective action process and managed by the organization so that we give operations a plant that will run well when we start it back up. Next slide. Another area I'd like to give you an update on is the containment internal structures. We have completed our analysis, and as Mr. Hay talked about, the NRC is reviewing it for the reload activities. We do have ongoing work in the technical area for power operations. There are differences uh, in the loads in the structure based on whether or not the cavity is full of water, whether the reactor head is on the stand, or whether it's on the flange of the reactor, and differences about uh, the loading in the containment, uh, whether or not the systems are operating at full pressure. So there are differences between a, a shutdown refueling condition and an app power condition, and the engineers are, are finishing the app power conditions and we continue to interface with the NRC on their important questions uh, for the containment internal structure for both uh, sets of conditions. Next slide. We have talked about containment uh, electrical penetration several times in these public forums. A significant amount of work has been completed. Over 5,000 terminations of wires have been by our maintenance staff. Uh, we are nearly complete with the testing. Uh, some of the testing uh, will be done as uh, the operation staff re-energizes certain equipment and we monitor whether or not the connections were made properly and that the system parameters are in the proper value for operations. Hey Bruce. Going back to the tape control structure, can you tell me what is the status of the auxiliary building? You know, that building that we looked at to determine if the extended condition is the same there as it was contained. Can you provide some discussion on that? Yeah, the extended condition uh, for the OX building uh, is complete, and that is documented in an operability evaluation. Uh, one of the advantages that we have right now for the tornado missile barrier work that's being done is it's being done by the same architect engineer that did the ox building evaluation. And they are very sensitive to any impacts that uh, may occur due to the locations of the steel where we're building the tornado missiles. Being very careful to put the loads on solid columns where uh, they can set the load and not in span the beam. Okay. So while the ox building are there not performing conditions in that sort of way? Yes, there are. And uh, we, we have continued work uh, to study what the, uh, whether or not we can further evaluate it and make it fully operable or whether or not there would be modifications in the future. <coughs> 
And now I'd like to talk about one of the major areas that we've reconstituted our design and licensing basis. Uh, it was touched on in the NRC's presentation, and that's in the area of uh, electrical equipment environmental qualification. This issue is an important issue because the environments that the equipment can be subjected to in a pipe break are not normally present in the plant. So just going out and testing the equipment and observing the equipment in its normal environment is not sufficient to guarantee that it will work in an accident. There's an in a significant body of work in the industry where components have been tested to very high temperatures, radiation, humidity, and water levels to ensure that equipment will operate in the accident conditions that it can be subjected to. As a prereq to that, we went back and looked at all of the analysis for the potential pipe breaks in all of the spaces in the building to understand what the temperatures and pressures would be and what radiation environments would exist both in the containment and in the auxiliary building to make sure that that equipment can perform its function. It's a significant amount of engineering work. It's nearly complete. The NRC has started to inspect and, and they continue to inspect. We can, uh, as we finish all of our analysis and all of the technical documentation of why all of the equipment will function, they will be able to finish their inspection. But right now, uh, we have a little bit more work to do and then uh, they'll be able to finish that inspection. This is a significant amount of work and a significant improvement for the plant. The next area I'd like to talk about is the area of equipment service life. Equipment service life is not a whole lot different than your gasket on your radiator cap uh, for your automobile. It has a rubber gasket on the cap. There is a frequency that you're supposed to replace it, and you should replace it at that frequency. If you don't replace it, that doesn't automatically mean your car is going to stop running, you're going to have a big steam leak on your radiator, and you're going to have to pull over and fix your car. Equipment service life is very much like that. Vendors have recommendations for equipment maintenance intervals on plant equipment. In the past, we have not always followed those. So what this project did was evaluate each piece of equipment and each type of equipment to make sure that we knew that it either needed to be replaced or we could extend it based on a body of knowledge both from the industry and from testing to ensure that it would perform its function. There were some cases where we did testing where we had failures. And when we had failures, we replaced those equipments. Where we didn't have failures and we had enough data to justify another cycle of operation, we justified it, we documented it. That work is ongoing and right now we're 60% of the way through the, the power operations uh, reviews. We have completed all of the refueling condition reviews and this will be completed prior to plant even. So the, the reviews you've done for equipment service life, are they a Largely, it's uh, one by one, but as you know, there were some categories, like we did take certain categories of relays, took a statistical sample of those relays, did a, a test, a body of test, and, and justified based on the results. But if we had failures, we went back and addressed those. So not in every case is it one by one. Uh, in some cases, it's by equipment type and vendor manufacturer. How was that information, if it was absent before, being incorporated into the station design? Or is that anything you have to do? It, it really falls into the preventive maintenance program and making sure that we maintain the equipment uh, properly. So the go forward uh, assumption for equipment to be able to perform its important safety functions is that it is in frequency in the PM program that we are following. Uh, manufacturer's recommendations of, or otherwise documenting our evaluation. So that information that will be incorporated into your preventive maintenance program, not a program that is an audio program. That's correct. Thank you. 
now I'd like to talk about uh, tornado missile protection. Uh, you can see in the picture uh, significant uh, amounts of steel being added. This, for example, is the Ox Building Ventilation uh, System. These protections are being added to ensure that a uh, tornado missile cannot come in vertically from the top of the building and enter in and impact systems underneath uh, the grating where the ventilation airflow comes in. Uh, we have done uh, a complete plant lockdown of systems required for safe shutdown of the unit. Uh, and we have done uh, a large amount of engineering to evaluate where a potential missile could impact safety related equipment required for safe shutdown. And in each and every case, we've addressed it uh, by showing that either it was adequately protected or by adding more protection to it. Next slide. Hey, Bruce. I'm just curious, because uh, I, don't, I don't think you completed a good pause yet on why this tornado missile condition exists. Just curious though, you know, back in April, I think we were talking three areas that needed to be addressed. Now we're talking 14 areas. You know, have, you, have you had any sort of analysis yet to understand what, what's the reason that these occur? I mean, it appears that just about anything outside the structures wasn't adequately addressed. And I'm just wondering, was it a, you know, it looks to me like it was a, initial design flaw, but I'm not sure if you the We agree. Uh, as you know, we rewind to March. Uh, this item was initially brought up during the inspection because we used a probabilistic method for evaluating the, the, the control room air conditioning units that were on the roof of the Ox building. When we looked through the paperwork, we found other examples where the diesel fuel fill and vent lines and the raw water pull boxes were not protected. We certainly were uh, taking the feedback seriously. We did a full walk down of the entire unit and went building by building, floor by floor, system by system to see if we had vulnerabilities. And in some cases, they're very subtle. It's a complete HVAC duct that comes into the building. You look at it, it doesn't look like there's any way for the missile to come into the building. And yet we know that sheet metal isn't going to stop a pipe that's going 100 miles an hour. And so we were able to step back, use the current NRC criteria as our uh, benchmark for uh, what we should be using for the missiles that are actually shown on the next slide. And we went through building by building and analyzed that. It, this is a subset of having an inadequate uh, design and licensing basis for our plan. And uh, we just need to bring it up to current standards. And that will be done in the rebaseline. In this case, it's being done in real time. And uh, it represents a, a huge uh, amount of work for the station. And, and I'll tell you, uh, we're quite proud of the way the staff is handled. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, I guess, you know, reiterate what you just said. You know, from, from my perspective, you know, after after we talked to you about, you know, not being able to accept the condition, it, it was refreshing and, and I think, you know, very insightful to see that that you did address it to go out and look for the extended condition, and, and now you are implementing a lot of And just to address the corrective action aspect of it, Mr. Hay. Uh, it, it important input into the overall design license basis for the cost analysis that was done. You know, a prime example that had to go drive you know, the, the work that we're doing there. Next slide. If I can ask a question, um, a lot of what you're doing now is, is going back to the history and how you got the cap. Is there any uh, interest in, uh, on your part in going forward and looking at standard aspects? I will tell you a lot of the challenges we have in review are related to <coughs> We have, uh, as you know, fundamental performance deficiencies that were reviewed as part of the 95003 process. One of those areas was in the area of regulatory systems, regulatory compliance. 
there is an action in that group files to evaluate whether or not we'll go to integrate uh, group textbooks. Um, we are considering that as we look at our design and licensing reconstitution. Uh, certainly, uh, there are financial aspects to that decision, uh, but we understand the input and that is in our corrective action program to consider as we move forward. In fact, that, that scope of study contracts been approved, and, and as Bruce mentioned, we'll work it through you know, the timeline post restart as it's laid out in the form of force efficiency. Again, um, it's a mix. There are still plants out there you know, that, that have not gone to the approved tech specs. And, and we'll make a conscious informed decision given all of the work that we're doing in design licensing basis area. And, and this is a is a is a proposal. Uh, not only helping the operators, but uh, there's you know, there's a lot of advantages to going through also. Thank you. Yeah, uh, with respect to the inspection report that was just issued for the white and contact violation, the, I believe the comments in the inspection report talked about contributing causes. One of the contributing causes for that issue, or uh, possibly multiple contributing causes, dealt with the technical specifications. And that was the analysis comments about whether or not we should be able to do a new cause or not. So that further comments about the technical specifications. Mine was a question. Well, there are certainly uh, lots of things that you say that are out there that cause the same thing that they've been operating on for many years. Certainly, is this certainly? Next slide. And now I'd like to give an update on our design and licensing basis uh, root cause uh, and the actions that we've taken going forward. Uh, we have completed the root cause as we discussed at the last public meeting uh, and actions to address uh, immediate issues are in progress. Uh, we have trained our operators and our engineers that use the design and licensing basis in our key processes uh, on the use of our design and licensing basis documentation and have put a significant uh, amount of effort in ensuring that the personnel understand their responsibilities for using it correctly, taking as much time as they need to do the reviews properly and get help if they have any confusion about the documentation. As an additional barrier, we have an engineering assurance group uh, that reviews all of the products that use the design and licensing basis information in place. Uh, they do grade the products and we give those uh, that feedback to the engineering leadership team to use so that they can use in coaching uh, the engineers and the reviewers of products and also to the operators. So we have, sorry, what is the expectation when the design or licensing based on the basis is silent on a particular issue we're looking at? What is what's your instruction to the engineers then? One of the advantages of being uh, in uh, the Exelon fleet where just that we can reach out to corporate we can talk to our licensing folks and to the corporate licensing uh, functional area manager. Uh, we can we have access to the other plants in the fleet design and licensing basis. We use the operating experience to see what others have. And if it's unclear, the direction to the, the staff is to stop, elevate to the right levels of the organization so that uh, the right people can get involved. If it gets to the level where it really impacts the decision, then we would enter into the uh, operational decision making that Mr. Prospero talked about earlier. Another activity, back please. Another activity that, that we have uh, undertaken is the key calculation review process. This takes all the key calculations in the in the plant categorizes them and then uh, we are screening those for uh, weaknesses and ultimately those calculations will be reviewed over a period of three to five years uh, to make sure that they're state of the art. Uh, this activity is consistent with what other uh, plants have done when they found that calculation weaknesses cause uh, difficulty for the engineering staff when you're using them. 
in their uh, design work going forward. Next slide. The go forward actions for our design and licensing basis project is really to benchmark uh, best practice plans so that we can define the model of how we should format the information. Uh, we certainly want to make it available to the engineers on their desktop computers and, and look at best practices so that they can use it at the point of where they need it, uh, that it's not difficult to retrieve. And uh, there are many industries, even outside of nuclear, where it's really an information control uh, project uh, in, in some aspects. Uh, but certainly in the nuclear uh, world, we have to go back and look at our actual license and any changes that we may need uh, going forward. And then the key calculations and key design drawings that uh, support that information will also be reviewed in, during that project. While we are doing that, uh, we will uh, do at least one system a year where we do a deep uh, dive in the design area, do a complete review, and uh, document our findings so that we continue to root out issues um, just as other plants that are operating today do. And then we will also maintain our engineering assurance group until the point where we have total confidence in our staff and uh, uh, we will keep that barrier in place to ensure that there is a backstop uh, for any errors that could occur. Next slide. And now I'd like to give you an update on uh, activities that we've taken on to address flooding that's well beyond the flood that occurred in, in 2009. Uh, and, uh, excuse me. Um, the, the flooding uh, mitigation, uh, we certainly have in place uh, mitigation up to our design basis uh, flooding levels. Uh, we have uh, taken a look at what we could do to improve our mitigation capability for floods that are significantly higher than that. Uh, we have bought um, portable pumps and tested those at the factory. Um, and we do have the procedures and uh, processes that we need for operations and maintenance to set those up in the event of a very severe flood beyond our design basis. And uh, continue with uh, developing our emergency procedures for that and the long term preventive maintenance instructions on that equipment. With that, I'd now like to turn it over to Scott Swanson, our operations director. Thank you, Bruce. Good evening. Again, I'm Scott Swanson, site operations director. I have over 35 years of experience in the industry, including 20 years. A licensed reactor operator. I also supported an industry group that performed assessments and evaluations of nuclear power plants across the country. Our job before Calhoun is to provide leadership and operational focus to ensure the facility is operated in a safe and conservative manner. The operations department is a diverse group of trained personnel, licensed operators, licensed senior operators. Operations monitors and controls the equipment and supports other departments with decisions on priorities for unit operation and equipment needs. Fueled reload is a key milestone for the return of Fort Calvin Station and requires consolidating the people, the plant, and the processes. The movement of the reactor fuel from the spent fuel pool to the reactor vessel appears straightforward but requires several prerequisites. Verified. We have made the station and equipment ready for reload. We have trained qualified operators and fuel handling specialists to safely move the 133 fuel assemblies to their proper location. Reactor engineers have developed fuel move logs and the verified computer instruments are ready to monitor the reactor board as it is reconfigured. The item remaining is to align the station license to upgrade the state of the facility for terminal protection that meet the current industrial standards. This is a regulatory obligation and is part of our process. Upgrades to the plant and the 
the license in this instance is one example of the improvements being made at Fort Gallup Station. Once the reactor field is loaded, some work remains, but much has been done. Several systems that ensure the core remains safe and cool have been tested and placed in service. The safety systems that provide capabilities to make up chlorated water for the reactor cooling system are ready. The emergency diesel generators are in standby to support electrical demands should offset power be lost. Radiation monitors are configured to monitor changes in any releases and at any key point within the facility. Once the core is loaded, cooling pumps and heat exchangers will work with other systems running now. The component cooling water system and spent fuel pool cooling allow the raw water to transfer heat from the fuel, which is currently less than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. While the fuel and primary systems are being worked, tested, and aligned, the secondary side of Fort Calhoun is already in operation to flush and clean the water that will circulate through the steam generator. Condensate has been in a layup state until about a month ago when the first condensate pump was restarted. The water quality was very good for being idle for such an extended period of time. The condensate coolers and pipes continue to be flushed to remove particulate oxidation that would delay returning them to full power when the chemistry parameter is not satisfied. Once Fort Calhoun station has been returned to service, the reactor core will provide heat to the reactor coolant system. The reactor coolant system will then be able to boil clean water in steam generators, which in turn spins the turbine and the generator to produce electricity. The condensation from this system requires a third element of the facility to operate. This is the circulating water system. The circulating water system has been in service for testing and performance confirmation for several months already. Work that I have described, including the start of station systems, is involved in people for Calvin. People support operations in engineering and maintenance and to the equipment. Chemistry and radiation protection personnel ensure that water process parameters are within prescribed limits. The administrative staff coordinates paper and business functions while security ensures that the fuel is under constant protection. Those at Fort Calhoun have been given job-specific training and hold qualifications for their assigned duties. The training staff ensures knowledge is integrated with process to dictate how these tasks are performed. As with any organization, oversight is required to monitor the behaviors and performance of the personnel. The supervisors and managers assess conduct and provide praise for distinguished performance. Coaching for those who need more direction and intervene in any instance when behavior is not aligned with the expectations. Finally, the people or oversight organization is tasked with providing an independent observation of all things supporting quality. With the new oversight group led by Mr. Keenan, there are reporting type, there are no reporting types at the station, rather they report directly to the Drift District. Performance that is good or found to need improvement is freely reported to the highest levels of OPPD. The new two oversight group assigns an assessor to each functional area and gives direct feedback on observations made to the department as a the station. This means there are many layers of the organization providing checks and balances for safe operation. Slide 22. As Fort Calhoun Station is ready for operation, combining efforts of these departments must be consolidated into a single plan. With each area understanding the goals and responsibilities and how they support error-free operation. For the operating department, we recognize that extended shutdowns have produced unique challenges individuals and custom running equipment. The newest members of the organization have not seen Fort Calhoun Station in service. They have yet to gain that even knowledge of the equipment and processes when they are on station. <coughs> to support readiness, operations have sent operators to other stations and has established partnerships with Exelon to bring in outside perspectives to oversee our fundamental performance. These partnerships have not only brought our other operators to Fort Calhoun, but are allowing us to benchmark their facilities in August. Training has recently supported operations with the unique exercise referred to the FAST crews. 
This is a Navy born exercise. During the extended shutdown, operations training has continued. Use of classroom simulator that the skill and knowledge current, testing and qualification are provided regularly. Much of this training has involved response to emergency conditions, but the fast cruise was designed to ensure readiness to sustain operation of the facility. The fast cruise experience ran for four days for four consecutive 12 hour shifts that had crews raising power from the simulator while performing routine rounds, surveillances, and attending to unexpected conditions that caused alarms or equipment or issues in the plant. These off normal occurrences that training provided required the operating crews to correctly assess the actions required by the technical specifications as well as reporting requirements dictated by regulations. The fast crews operating procedures, coordination with engineers, and oversight, all mandate critical parameters for operation to be anticipated, monitored, and responded to found to be out of balance. Process temperature, pressures, and flows are trended and controlled. The equipment itself is monitored by a predictive maintenance program that looks to anticipate equipment issues before they occur by detecting parameter changes such as increased barrier temperature elevated vibration levels or hot spots detected by thermography. On slide 23, there is a list of several very substantial improvements made to support equipment reliability, including the new penetrations, the support containment of the primary systems, new breakers, piping, and control systems. Slide 24. Scott, I have a question. Yes, sir. Okay. You go through all these upgrades, a lot's been done in the standard period of time. Have you done a check of the simulator fidelity to make sure that it aligns to the current plan configuration of what we Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have checked that. And that was one thing that the crews were monitoring and comparing as they went through their past crews exercise besides the three walls. Yeah, a, a key part of our modification process that, uh, that ties back to the simulator. As you mentioned up there, a new turbine control system that was put in you know, the beginning part of the average in the simulator box off the roof of the to get more efficient. Even part of that process will benchmark how the, you know, how the actual plant performs and the feedback we have to the um, Also, you were talking about, you know, that you had some staff that
process applied across the discipline review, using licensed operators, field operators, and engineers. The procedures were verified to be accurate and field validated to be useful. The previous process provided sure these steps were applied and the procedures for quality fell behind the industry. The procedure project contained for Calhoun's revision process to a new level. An issue found in one procedure is considered for its extended condition throughout other procedures. The procedures are ensured to flow from one release to another. So, Mr. Swanson, can you describe how the procedures are verified on the technical after? The uh, checklist that the operators review or use when they uh, review their procedures will consider them against the design, against the tax specs, against uh, similar procedures to make sure there are no omissions and that they're consistent one to another in the uh, design. So is this so this is a checklist that is part of a procedure or right. So, so right. you're using a, a proceduralized process for your procedure upgrade project? Right, part of the uh, AP process. How do you deal with information that's missing? I understand the chief validated the information that's there, but what about information that's potentially missing? As an example, there was an event notification within the last couple of months. Um, with respect to the system potentially not being able to perform its safety function, and in the cause analysis, the station did uh, certain steps and procedure that had been removed. And then since been learned that that was a uh, potentially deficient condition, how do you how do you go and look for those instances? The uh, cross discipline review that the process uses is to support identifying conditions such as that. Um, the review of the procedures is to add in information. So, so if I just pick up on the question on and I'll just swap sides. Going forward, you know, how would we mitigate or not make an error and change the procedure that would put us outside of the design of the system. I think we've got some good checks and balances on that. Uh, not only at the site, but in, in, in the fleet component, as Bruce mentioned before, where there's an absence of information on you know what you don't know. Um, and then part of the design and license basis reconstruction will have an important tie back to the you know, critical parameters and emergency operating procedures, abnormal operating procedures. But if that's a going forward component and an important going forward uh, of that project. The work that's been done right now has been, uh, as Scott mentioned, you know, to flush out you know, technical issues as well as human performance issues, as well as just overall formatting, as you mentioned, to get it up to uh, reconsider current industry standards. And certainly in the emergency operating procedures, we have the benefit of, uh, of, of the owners group, which uh, it gives us some good structural guidance for improving those procedures. So will there be a product that is produced by this upgrade project, or is it again a one by one procedure change type process? The product includes the upgrade to the procedure review process and the uh, documents, the procedures themselves, that are going through that and being upgraded. Obviously, as the station is finding efficient issues, they're issuing the condition before it's out of the set. Yeah, and, and as we talk about plan for sustained improvement again, this is a, you know, the initial cut that we take with the operations procedure. But there's more work that's, that will be post we start not only the operating procedures, uh, but also the maintenance procedures and some of the other you know, key tools that we use to uh, communicate. As part of that process, we were sensitive to uh, the quality of the work that we're doing to ensure that the process changes at the industry standards. Fort Calhoun Operations Department provided an assessment of the upgrade process and the procedures. That team was comprised of Fort Calhoun managers outside of the operations department with previous operating experience. Another shift manager with 38 years experience from Exelon and a fourth member from the combustion engineering plant similar to Fort Calhoun all support the assessment. From this assessment, it found one strength associated with the procedure attachments that provide necessary detail for consistent task execution. There are several recommendations that were made on the procedure revision process itself, such as adding the requirement to consistently perform procedure validations. It was also identified that improving procedure reviewers' familiarity with the 
revision process to meet support quality, especially if they were provided specific checklist items to support consistent verifications of document format. For example, adding in details about the component limitations as part of the MSA response procedure. There was one, there was one deficiency found in the reference made to an earlier investment guideline rather than a more current revision for an MSA response procedure development that is being corrected. In closing, I am proud of the operators that I lead. I am honored to be a member of the team that looks forward to operating Fort Belton Station. I can personally state that I have confidence in the commitment and capabilities of the station to operate the facility in a safe and conservative manner. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate the perspective, and more importantly, as Scott discussed, the leadership of driving operational readiness to support these funds. We thought it was important to spend a little bit more time, not only talking about procedures, but overall operations and operational readiness, so appreciate that. I do want to transition, though, to looking forward to post-restart and our plan for sustained improvement. Where I've established the policy at Fort Calhoun and the culture for continuous improvement, it's not only the tools, you'll see the performance improvement integrated matrix, which we call the PIM, but it's also the extensive corporate over oversight and external oversight to ensure that the improvement actions remain on track. So the plan has gone through our external nuclear safety review board this week, who was on site looking at this, as well as other activities. And it is in final review right now as we're incorporating their comments. We believe it has the right level of detail over 78 detailed corporate site and department level action plans that are included in the PIM. And, and an important subset of actions, uh, which you'll see us call our key drivers, and that really will form the basis for our post restart commitments. The key drivers, they'll address multiple areas, and those areas ought to look familiar to us. The significant pre restart progress has been completed. In each one of these, many of which that we've highlighted and discussed tonight. It also does include the analyzed gaps across 27 station functional areas. That's the foundation for our transition to the Exelon nuclear management model and ultimately integration into the fleet. Each one of those areas has detailed implementation plans again to drive that alignment. And as we've discussed, in some cases where we've opted to pull things forward, operational decision making is a good example. And as I turn it over, uh, the presentation over to Kerry Heenan, nuclear oversight is a good example where we've opted to accelerate the adoption of many of the tools that makes nuclear oversight uh, a strength of the Exelon fleet. So with that, I will turn it over to our nuclear oversight manager, Mr. Kerry Heenan. Thank you, Lou. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Heenan. I am the nuclear oversight manager at OGPD. As the nuclear oversight manager, I am completely independent of the nuclear operations I report to OPP Corporate Vice President, Bo Gawdon. Tonight, I will discuss the independent oversight of Fort Kellen and give you my independent perspective of Fort Kellen Station performance. First, I'd like to discuss the changes that we have made to strengthen the independent oversight of Fort Kellen Station. OPPD has made changes in the corporate governance and oversight to ensure that the subtle indicators of protracted performance decline do not go unaddressed in the future stay on the path of continuous improvement. OPPD established a strategic plan which incorporates work element station and corporate level procedures that clearly defines the expectation, roles, and responsibilities for all individuals. OPPD established a new corporate nuclear governance and oversight committee, ODOG and chairs this committee. This committee meets monthly on site and receives input from various station leaders regarding all aspects of activity. This provides a source of frequent, independent oversight of Fort Allen's performance. They report their insights and results to the Chief Executive Officer and the Board of Directors. We've also improved the Nuclear Oversight Department at Fort Kellen. We implemented the excellent model for nuclear oversight. This is one of the aspects of the model that we implemented earlier. The excellent nuclear management model includes strong accountability and oversight checks and balances. This provides enhanced insurance the OPPD has well-structured, independent, and intrusive oversight of Fort Kellen Station performance and reflects a new and broader focus for the Nuclear Oversight Department beyond compliance with the focus on action. I am the Nuclear Oversight Manager. I've held this position for 11 months. 
I have 28 years of nuclear experience in engineering and operations, and I've held the senior rank or operator's license. I also worked seven years for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as an operating license candidate examiner and as a resident inspector. Before coming to Fort Calhoun, I was the nuclear oversight manager for five years at operating excellent. Nuclear oversight includes the traditional functions of quality assurance and quality control, but it also includes new accountabilities for oversight, observations, and audits beyond the minimum regulatory requirements, with a focus on behaviors that lead to and sustain excellence in nuclear operations. My team of 20 individuals perform inspections, audits, and assessments of station activities. Our role is to challenge the station behaviors, their adherence to standards and expectations, identify improvements needed, and any gaps to excellence. We transformed my team utilizing the excellent process to be more intrusive and critical of station performance, and we are having an impact on the accountability for and reinforcing those expect expected values and behaviors. We've also improved the confidentiality of our employee concerns program which is now reporting directly to the corporate office. The Employee Concerns Program is just one of many avenues that employees have to raise concerns. We've increased the number of fully qualified individuals to accept employee concerns. We've completed training for all Fort Calhoun station personnel, establishing, regarding establishing and maintaining the safety conscious work environment. As a result, random interviews conducted by the Employee Concerns individuals does show an increased trust and confidence in our employee concerns program. We've also improved the expertise and effectiveness of our nuclear safety review board, what we call our NSRP. This is the independent assessment function required in our license. The NSRP is chaired by a retired NRC senior executive and includes OPPD and Exelon executive. It also utilizes four subcommittees chaired by highly experienced outside nuclear industry this membership is aligned with the rest of the Exelon fleet to ensure consistent application of the Exelon management model that will ensure Fort Calhoun improvements. This collegial body reports directly to the OPPD Chief Executive Officer and Board of Directors. These outside experts provide independent review of the performance of Fort Calhoun. These improved aspects of independent assessment, the Governance and Oversight Committee, Nuclear Oversight, and the Nuclear Safety Review are providing a more intrusive, independent look and challenge to station performance. And as noted by the NRC during the last public meeting, there has been a significant improvement in nuclear oversight. We have made significant progress. Next slide. Now I'd like to share with you some of the results of my staff's independent assessment of Fort Calhoun performance. My team has been focused on the efforts the station is taking to get ready for restart. We've created an oversight plan for the Fort Calhoun return to service. Areas that we've reviewed that require additional management attention include implementation of the corrective action program, especially in the engineering area. The engineering organization has been challenged with a large workload. Due to that workload, a large backlog exists in the corrective action program. The timeliness of corrective action closure, as well as the closure quality of some issues, needs improvement. The station has taken actions to address this gap <coughs> to excellence, as Mr. Proskauer outlined earlier with additional resources. In the area of design and licensing basis activities, my team reviewed the activities being conducted by the Engineering Insurance Group, and actions were taken to address the concerns that we raised. Also in this area, the management of quality records that are used to document the design and licensing basis needs additional attention. The NOS plan has also noted areas that are meeting expectations, including the improvements that have been made to the plan, the management meetings and quality challenges, and the efforts with the integrated performance improvement plan and the plan for sustained improvement and attribution. Similar to the Governance and Oversight Committee and the Nuclear Safety Review Board, my organization has seen improvements in station performance. These are just a few examples of the contribution that independent oversight is making to enhance safety for the government. And now I'd like to turn the presentation back to the board. If I could, um, to what extent is your organization involved in independently assessing the operability Mr. Martin, my team reviews all of the operability determinations. Um, we also review the 5059s, but in 
addition, the 5059s are also reviewed by our nuclear safety review. Um, and any of those potential uh, 5059s will require a license amendment request, those get reviewed by the nuclear safety review board. Thank you. Yeah, in particular, those areas, some of the issues that you know, we discussed tonight. Uh, we've offered to use additional amount of fleet expertise, but industry expertise in those areas, uh, separate from what uh, just needed in this organization, uh, recognizing uh, obviously the importance of getting over there. All right, thanks, Gary. Uh, Try to leave us with a high-level visual look, again, by manual chapter 350 item on our status. A uh, similar that was discussed by the, or described by the energy, but we're not going to go into each level. Uh, but as you can see, not only on this slide, but on the next, a significant amount of work that has been done. Uh, we believe we understand and have scheduled what remains as we work through, uh, especially the inspection process for each of the areas. So in closing, tonight we did update you on the substantial recovery actions that have been completed, which does tie towards our progress towards plant restart. Quick update on our post restart plan for sustained improvement, as well as one key way that we're validating our progress, which is through independent assessment. So, we would like to thank you again for this opportunity. At this time, we'll turn the meeting back over to Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. First, everybody in the
for that um, particular license in action as well. So I just wanted to kind of remind people, you know, it's, a, it's um, being processed as, as an exit. And if you have questions about that, you know, um, it's a good resource. Okay, now it's time for the question and answer portion. It is about 8.20, so we will run for a four, full hour. It's about 9.20 to so give everyone an opportunity for their questions and comments. I like to set some ground rules, and we've used them in the past, and they seem to work pretty well. We would like to give everyone that wants to speak an opportunity to be heard, so please make your statement brief. If you have prepared a statement, Please keep it down to two or three minutes or summarize it. That way everyone has an opportunity to make their own question or comment. If you have several points, if you have several points you'd like to make, please make one and come back after everyone else has been heard. If during your question, an exchange pursues where it becomes a back and forth conversation between you and one of the parties up here, we will cut it short and ask that you uh, restate your question after the meeting with that individual so that we don't take up a lot of time during this portion. Again, the purpose of this meeting is to focus on the safety of Fort County Station. Let's stray away from any fiscal matters with OPPD. Those types of questions may be best handled at an OPPD board meeting. However, if it is an urgent question, OPPD Public Affairs is here and will be able to answer your question after the meeting. As for the layout, you can either stay in your seat and I can come over to you with the mic or we can form a line right here in the middle. Lastly, I would like to emphasize respect. We have a lot of different opinions here, both for and against nuclear power, but we want everyone to be heard, so please, let's be civil and respect each other. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. When I come, I'm not speaking that loud. When I come to you, please state your name, any affiliation that you would like to be associated with, and who you are directing your question to, either the NRC or for Campbell Management. I'm Wally Taylor, I'm with the uh, Iowa Chapter of the Sierra Club. I have several questions for OPPD. Uh, first of all, what are you doing to fix or to replace the deficient structural beams and columns that were noted in previous inspections. The columns and beams in the containment uh, do not have physical deficiencies, they're analytical deficiencies. And what we've done is done an analysis of those. And for future outages, we are evaluating what uh, potential fixes are out there. It's a very complex issue. Uh, we've just discussed this several times in public meetings, but the columns and beams are not cracked and not deficient in, in any physical sense. Um, but for future uh, outages, uh, there is consideration of what will be done. But for this restart from this outage, that will be handled under an operability of are you going to seek a license modification for any repairs or changes that you make to the beams and columns? Not at this time, there's none required. Thank you. We'll come back to you. Thank you. I'm Marianne Presman, 1902 Oak Street. It's very troubling to see that the significant deficiency at Fort Calhoun's Corrective Action Program are still continuing. The NRC's recent report regarding an inspection that focused on operations cited numerous violations that involved failures related to problem identification and resolution associated with Fort Calhoun's Corrective Action Program. OPPD has known since the 1990s that its procedure quality is poor and needs improvement. Yet OPPD has frequently failed to correct the problems identified. In light of this, I was concerned to read in the NRC's inspection report the benchmark 
it had selected for closure of the procedure quality checklist item. The NRC said this item would remain open until it understands the station's plan to evaluate known deficiencies and identify efforts to be taken prior to restart. Just understanding the station's plan as a benchmark is not good enough. Fort Calhoun has had lots of plans over the years to correct its known problems. But as the NRC report clearly states, the licensee often fails to correct problems identified. What's needed is actual correction of all the deficiencies before the NRC considers this item ready for closure. The NRC cannot seriously claim that it assures public safety if it signs off on this very significant, long-standing deficiency by just requiring yet another plan from OPD. Use of even one inadequate procedure could lead to that catastrophe at the nuclear plant. The NRC needs to verify that every one of the deficiencies at Board of Calhoun is indeed corrected before the nuclear plant can be considered ready for restart. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Ryan, I don't know. I'd like to take a comment to address that. Even though it wasn't the question, uh, she brings up some really good points. And I think the, uh, you know, from, from, from looking at the report, the intent of what was written wasn't to indicate that we're only looking to understand the plan. Uh, the inspection team looked at what critical flaws weren't addressed that would affect the plant recently. And we noticed that there were a number that weren't adequately addressed. And so what we wanted to understand is what is the plan for licensing to address those critical flaws that we see to prior to restart? And then also what is the plan long term to address the overall improvement of procedures that, that aren't critically flawed but could be improved from the manner of they, they, they uh, uh, are, are easier for the operators to work through, uh, that sort of thing. So, so I do agree with you, and the NRC is ensuring that, that procedures that need to be addressed prior to restart are addressed. And we also want to ensure that from a long-term perspective, in general, all of the procedures are looked at so that they are the whole process is Linda Ryan, I know we appear in Omaha. And my question uh, is in two part. First of all, members of the O350 committee have commented at previous meetings that the committee will do a flood analysis for the Fort Calhoun plant before any restart is allowed. And a letter sent to Clean Nebraska from Chairwoman McFarland last November. She stated that, and I quote, any immediate, any immediate safety concerns identified during the evaluation of the flooding effects at Fort Calhoun will be evaluated before the licensee is allowed to restart the nuclear power plant, unquote. In light of this, and the concerns expressed at the last meeting about debris being carried by a catastrophic flood caused by upstream dam failures, how are you factoring in and analyzing the effect of large debris on Fort Calhoun carried by this wall of water? This is from the NRC. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that as we talked about, you know, not only is the licensee being uh, looked at from the the current licensing basis for flood conditions, but we're also taking actions to address the greater with respect to debris, there, you know, when we had the flood of 2011, that was a concern that the licensee did when we saw it. So, you know, there is an understanding that when we have a flood, we will have higher water, we may have debris. And the NRC is looking at that. And I know from the design basis perspective, we're uh, You're saying you may have debris. 
great. I, I just want to say this is something that is very serious, perhaps the biggest threat in Port Calhoun right now. A catastrophic dam failure is very possible with the climate change that we've been seeing. I mean, you can't deny it. Uh, this debris comes down, and I, I have to say, you cannot have any restart, any consider a restart, without having this evaluated, the, the analysis. We'd like to see that. The second part of my question. I'm also wondering what kind of technical papers, research, and assessment tools you're utilizing in this flooding evaluation. Well, what we're using for beyond our basis for evaluation of the first studies. Excuse me, in here. For the United States Army Corps of Engineers studies. That's, that's the best group that provide information for the flood levels. I would like to also add that you know, Fort Cacoon is not unique in this respect because all the places in the country are responding to the NRC uh, direction of last year to report back for their demand less than 200 uh, actions. So uh, Fort Cacoon will be processed for the on design basis information that's provided for all that everybody else. All the clients. Okay, and uh, this will be evaluated and completed before any research.
Mr. Sutherland. And 
as my life and I should move climate change. That's more likely to happen now than ever. Uh, Garrison did uh, during the flood of 2011. Uh, there was so much water coming out of the spillway that it was eroding the dam at the base of the dam. It was cutting back into the dam. They had to close the spillway gates, bring trucks of large rock in there, and dump them down below the spillway before they could open the gates. So I think, I think there needs to be more of a definitive analysis of this uh, flood threat caused by catastrophic dam failure uh, done before any consideration is made to restart the plan. Thank uh, you, Mr. Moran. Yeah, I'll stop now. Anyone wants to comment on that? Okay, thanks. Uh, you pose the um, radiation exposure for the employees and the public. I was wondering if that was based on the large man model from the past, or was that based on the smaller stature and the children? As we know now, with recent research that they're affected. I'm going to have to ask, uh, ask that question in the show. Well, in, in the past, they, you, you have a rating which based your radiation exposure on a large man. And, and then, and then uh, recent research has shown that small stature people are affected more and children are affected more. When you're closing on the public, you're closing on the, you know, the workers, um, you know, the children, the communities around and all that kind of stuff. So I was wondering which basis did you base it on? The large man basis or the new information that small stature people are affected? Yeah, to tell you the truth, neither. Um, we weren't looking at new methods of, of whether or not large or small, what we're looking at is the licensees' processes for protecting the public from any exposure and ensuring that they have adequate controls, not only to protect the worker, but to protect the public. And, and so what, what we're focusing on is the processes that minimize exposures. We're not looking at the methods that are used to calculate how much dose a person will receive. We're looking at ensuring that as achievable, you know, from that perspective. So I, I think what you're asking is more of a question of a, of a methodology of assessing those when we're talking about is the processes and licenses of And then um, uh, back when geologic studies were being discussed several weeks ago, there was a geologic feature underneath the head. Anybody looked into that geologic feature? Is the cavern? Is it a rubble in it? You know, the situation that people are getting out farther. And of course, you know, with 25,000 gallons of water that was driven back into the you know, river from the 1990s, um, and we do know that there's some you know, contamination of groundwater on the site. So I was wondering if there's any updates on getting that information. Well, I guess I'm not quite understanding what you mean by it. Well, there's some observations, but if you look at the original um, blueprints of the plan, it shows this geologic feature, and it's never been investigated to find out what the feature is. If it's a stone, or if it's a cavern, or if it's a little rubble, and, and it's weird. If you look at that, I have that blueprint on my YouTube channel, and it's a head, and it's a sun. So, I don't know why you don't have that blueprint. Well, I think you don't have it, but I'm telling you, I'm not aware of it. There is a geologic feature between the head if you're not aware of it, not making it work. When you say the head, you're talking to the best of the head. I don't know if they hear the, you know, the rocks that can't take the land or something. You know where the rocks are with, you know, the container with the radiation? Yes, yeah. The reactor head and the right. well, really other people in the face. If you're going to try to get underneath that, you'll find a geologic feature. Oh, you're talking in the ground? Yes. Under the, yes, yes, underneath. Right, that is correct. Right. Uh, I guess I would ask you to provide us what you're talking about so we can look at it and, and we can back to you. But I'm not, you know, I'm not aware of any geological anomaly that we are currently inspecting. I'm not aware of it. I'll leave that And then the question over here, you decided to do the um, reconstitution of design based documents after the start. 
Is that a safety question or an economic question? Because I would think that having the full reconstitution design these documents would be a safer way of going before we restart. Yeah, but first, let me start with that. Um, what we illustrated tonight was a number of the actions that we've taken to give our cars reasonable assurance. Not only with the documentation that we have, but additional backstops that we would put in place you know, to make more technical the design decisions. And then, and then really use it. And there's, there's plants in the country right now that are a couple years into this process that are really being able to take advantage of, of that intelligence, of how to scope and do this once and for all to support the plant the operation, not to mention who the people bring in, but to support plant operation going you know, forward. So the risk base that, uh, that we will assure ourselves of is what Mr. Rash had touched on, that, uh, that we've got good assurance that uh, if we can make the right technical decisions now, then we continue to improve that going forward. So, so why was it set? Why was the whole reconstitution set after? That's what I'm trying to find out. Like, because it just seemed like you have all the information before you restarted, that would be safer than having some of that that you yeah, but the, 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 there's a fair margin question. The, the duration that we would anticipate, best on, based on the best practices right now, um, it, it would take us in the three to five year range. Uh, recognizing that we we'll prioritize, even under of the activities we've already prioritized right now, uh, to give us the highest assurance, especially when we're talking about uh, you know, an old more significant system out there. But the right thing to do is to, is to approach this as the industry has. Currently, as well as historically, to go about this in a methodical, uh, get speed manner, um, and, and recognize that as we find things, which we suspect we'll find some things, you know, in some cases that may be to shut the plant down. Uh, we understand that, um, but we also recognize that uh, you know, the, the lessons learned that the industry has used to, to complete these projects um, consistent with that. And Thank you. Well, we need it again. Uh, you allegedly made some significant changes or modifications to address the flooding problem. And also, in the March 11, 2013 inspection report, it was noted that you made some modifications with respect to flooding without asking for a license amendment. But the NRC said you should have asked for a license amendment. My question is, regarding all of the flooding modifications that you've made, the modifications to address the flooding, are you going to apply for a license amendment? The modifications that we made to the mitigating systems for flood do not require a license amendment. We reviewed those under 5059, and uh, it's not required. Has the NRC confirmed that? No, we, we have not yet completed our review of those, which is evaluations that determine whether or not they need to receive review. I'm concerned that everything that they have done, that there's no modification to the plan, they claim you don't need a license amendment. It seems to me you do. Uh, with respect to the, the karst geology that Mr. Crane was talking about, that comes from the names and more reports in 1967 and 68 before the plant was built. And they confirmed there's karst geology, which is fractured lines <coughs> about 60 to 70 feet under the surface. And it's right under the reactor. And I have those reports and I can certainly forward them to you. Yeah, please do. We would really like to get the information to us. And then we could have our geologists and people that yeah, I mean, we've, we've done intensive inspections related to the flood impact on the soils and you know, on the sediments. And, and so I, I just never heard any of them bring up that there's a geological anomaly that, that they're aware of and concerned of. So I'm not saying it's not an issue that we need to address. All I'm saying is I'm just not aware of it. I looked at a few technical reports that were done post-flood, and if you look at those closely, it looks to me like they 
uh, they just looked at the uh, topsoil basically and didn't really look at the underlying geology. Um, well, I think it was, uh, we heard a lot of stuff review today. We were supposed to do the geotechnical review, and we got our technical staff to review the impact of the flooding underneath that area. And I know they used techniques to look at the low this water just to make sure that there's some other ground uh, uh, below the surface water that could have you know, affected the structure of the bones that are important. I know that was looked at. And, and all that will be documented. Um, at the April 22nd, 2013 technical meeting of the NRC and uh, the OPBD uh, consultants, there were several modifications that would require a license amendment. One was the tornado protection that the uh, OPBD has just applied for them for this week. The others were alternate seismic criteria and methodologies, piping codes, and equipment reclassifications. So are you going to ask the license amendment for those other uh, issues? Those have been evaluated under operability evaluations. There is future license amendments, and the topic of the public meeting was when those would be required. And the NRC still has to inspect the operability evaluations. But our position is that those license amendments will be after restart. After restart? That's correct. Right. Why not before? It's not required. Okay, for the NRC, uh, are you going to require license amendments for all the things that I've discussed with the OPPD? Well, it's interesting you asked the question. Recently, have been requesting for the license to review these other bees because they were just recently completed. So, yes, we will be reviewing the operability determinations. We will be reviewing the 5059 analysis. And we will be assessing whether or not a NRC review approval is needed or not. So, my answer is we haven't yet inspected the conclusions. <coughs> That will be happening in the Fire Commission. And one last thing. Um, the license amendment for the tornado protection that was filed this week, uh, I'm on the email list for the Fort Calhoun notifications, and I just got it this morning. It may have come late yesterday, and I, I didn't see it, but. But I just got it this morning. And comments are due by the end of the day tomorrow. And it's unreasonable, and in fact, it's absurd as far as I'm concerned, to expect the public to wade through almost 40 pages of technical gobbledygook and come up with comments in, in less than two days. Uh, I think that's. Contrary to what NRC has tried to do all the way along in allowing the public to be involved. And I, I, I request that you allow some more time. I don't think there's an exigent circumstances here. In every context I've ever had experience with the term exigent circumstances, it means an emergency. There's no emergency here. And uh, the only excuse OPBD put up for extra circumstances is that, well, if, if they had to, to go through a regular license amendment process, it, it would delay their restart. But they're not supposed to restart anyone. And that's not the point. It's not an emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And, and I just want to point out, um, actually, as far as our, our um, processes and regulations um, are actually there is an emergency um, um, classification as well, and that's not what is being considered for this. This is actually um, a um, request under an exigent um, amendment process. And you know, the, the, the criteria, you know, the, the licensee makes the case for why they, um, 
exaction and then what we do is we um, evaluate that and that's you know um, um, one of the aspects that we do when we um, get this type of amendment in and um, basically the criteria um, it is evaluated by um, the, the staff and also by our legal counsel as well but when we get it in we put it through the, the process and that's the, the process as you see you know um, which you know we have the um, the, the notice in the posting for it, you know, we, we um, go through that um, process. Um, I can tell you more about the, um, the, the actual criteria that we use and how we apply it for, for the exigent amendments. Uh, yeah, back to the, uh, the point of the April meeting, they, they raised several issues with us, and the licensee had a certain path and strategy they were pursuing, and when we reviewed the documents, we did an independent assessment. Essentially, we didn't necessarily agree with the conclusions they had, but it didn't require them. So, where we end up in, in the nature of the modification, and I will say this to go back a little bit the plant has made substantial enhancements in terms of the financials. So, what we're reviewing is not just a paper change of the plant, there are actual meaningful facility modifications being made to make the plant better than it ever has been. Uh, the problem and the reason why this one is, uh, is required is even though, although they're proposing to adopt a new standard that is NRC approved, it differs from their current licensing basis. And so when we look through our independent evaluation of what does their current licensing basis say and what is it that they're proposing to do, albeit something that probably would be acceptable to the NRC, they still did not meet the 59 evaluation. So we never put their opinion on that. They felt that it didn't need it, and that we disagreed. Now, each one of those other items that we reviewed in the paper meeting, theoretically, when we could get the material, whatever evaluation they perform, we'll do our own independent assessment. We may or may not They may be sufficient. I don't know. We'll know if we see it. And, and so we give them the healthy independent review that they require. Now, on the other side of things, the standard that they're proposing to adopt is the same standard that would be applied to new reactors that would be built. It is based on new information, new research, and new tornado data that has been developed long since the BPD store weapons station Now they could have pursued another avenue, which is an emergency avenue. They pursued an exit from the different OC requirements. The only real difference here, excuse me, is an OC. You just don't have 30 days of comment for an agent or emergency. Thank you. Again, for the record, Mike Ryan, Clinton, Nebraska. Uh, I have here a letter uh, that was sent to the NRC uh, July 10th uh, to the Office of the Federal FOIA Ombudsman by Paul Gunter uh, from the Leon Luper. Uh, last year, uh, in May, May 18th to be exact, he did a FOIA, an information request of the NRC for documents uh, relating to primarily uh, effects of the flood on underground cables and pipes. And uh, uh, evidently the FOIA folks thought that, thought that was a little bit too broad, so they narrowed it down somewhat. Well, on the back page of his letter, um, he's got a list of about uh, no, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different times that the NRC has come back to the FOIA folks with excuses as to why they can't give him the documents. And there's about everything on here, uh, with the exception of the dog ate my homework, uh, in this case, the documents. Um, do you have any idea what the problem is? Why isn't this man uh, having his FOIA request honored? Is it something with the uh, uh, 0350 panel? Uh, are you guys having a problem with the request? Is it coming from uh, Washington? What's the deal? Is it not go through the 0350 panel at all? Nobody, and 
heard have you heard of this request? Have you made the request? Well, generally the process in, internally to the NRC is if you have a FOIA request, it goes out to the people that would be most likely to have records. But there is a um, entity inside of the agency that actually is, re is responsible for processing these, these requests. So I, to be quite honest with you, I'm not familiar with the contents of the letter because that was probably put together by you know, the, um, the, the, the folks that are responsible for responding to FOIA requests because they're sending it out to a number of different people that would have records, you know, that would. Um, would be responsive to that request. So they would be the ones that would um, be getting this information and compiling it into a website. Um, I, I, I don't know this particular one, but I can tell you, I just put that FOIA request process in the FOIA office every week. Sometimes, just and what you describe in his, I don't know if that's the case, but if they assign it to a particular plan, that makes it rather easy to do. If they assign it to all plans in the country, that makes it really hard. So the, the office goes back to some kind of way to narrow it or take the plan to put your interest versus just all things. Because it can be a huge labor effort. And when you're comparing it with all the other things you have to do, uh, the, this is just the 2011 flood uh, at Fort Gallo. And my guess is most of this documentation would be coming from Region 4. Uh, because, because you're the watchdogs, and there's the watchdogs for Fort Gallo. Um, but if you don't know, you don't know, I guess. Um, my second, uh, I guess, question is for OPPD. Uh, I listened to the December NRC meeting that was uh, uh, conducted in Washington that we attempted to listen to over the telephone. Anybody that listened over the telephone will know that you probably uh, we're lucky if you got 40% of what was said during that meeting. But uh, reflecting that, I remember a, a number of outside engineering firms were there that were hired by OEPD. And uh, there were statements made about since the 90s, OEPD was aware of all these containment internal structure problems. And uh, uh, they sounded serious. Uh, they sounded real. Uh, why would OPPD hire these outside engineering firms to, to deal with this and admit that they have these kind of structural problems? Now, I know it would be very expensive. I think they were talking about how they'd have to replace like 18 columns that hold up floors. I can imagine the expense of coming in there and putting up 18 concrete columns within an existing building. Uh, I don't know how you do it. I don't know if the doors are wide enough to get enough concrete in there to do that. Uh, anyway, that was one of the things. The other thing uh, that was pointed out uh, during that meeting was a significant loss over time of design documentation. In other words, what was at the plant, uh, what was supposed to be kept in a room at the plant wasn't there anymore. And then there were statements made about how uh, the as-built drawings didn't match the design specifications anyway. So it sounds like a pretty serious problem there. Now, I remember a couple years ago, William Rockwell saying that uh, modeling is kind of like a prisoner of war. You tortured enough, it will tell you anything you want. Uh, and I get the impression that uh, OPPD is using modeling to deal with these containment internal structure problems. You're using a modeling program now to tell you that they don't exist or they aren't serious. Is that the case? Be the first question. And secondly, what percentage of the design documents aren't there and how far off is the as-built condition from the design documents. Yeah, Rousseau has just touched on the, the technical work and, and obviously the extensive technical work that's continued since the December time frame. And I'll let you touch on the containment internal structures and then I'll brought up the design Okay, on the December 12, 2012 meeting at NRR, we discussed the weaknesses in the design for the containment 
same in internal structures. We had our vendors there that had done not only the primary engineering for the inputs and the analysis, but also the third party reviewer that did the expert review of our work. During that discussion, we did talk about the discovery. The discovery was made when we were doing modifications to the CCW component cooling water system hanger in the containment for a future power upgrade. That was in, in the recent time frame. We did go back and look at what the cause was for why the containment internal structure design was not well understood and there was some of the documentation that was deficient. The vendors that we hired have been in the process of reconstituting that and they haven't been doing it beam by beam and column by column. They've been using an integrated model that is much more accurate using modern terms than what you would do in the 1960s because the computation ability is significantly better than it was in the 60s. But the design is well understood, it's safe. We documented that in over 30,000 pages of calculations, had to review by several engineering firms. Right now it's under review by the NRC. Yeah, this, this is Bob now, as you acknowledge, not only this meeting, recognizing the scope and the commitment to go fix the design license basis once and for all. And as we talked about again tonight with that also, the, the information that are taking place to help us make sound technical decisions and sound design decisions on part of us. And then we have to be recognized a commitment going forward uh, to rectify the commitment. And as we have other things, um, I mean, number of the discovery items that we talked about tonight, there was much penetrations, a little discussions we had with uh, the system of recovery. Um, we'll continue to use those tools that we've used and owned over the last two years to find and fix problems. How far? How much of this uh, uh, case of design documents is, is missing and, and how far off is the as-built condition of the plant? Now, I heard uh, that during the flood, uh, folks at the plant realized that there was a, a leaky pipe in the uh, turbine room. Now, I realize that's not on the radioactive side necessarily of the plant. But when they went to look for that pipe, uh, using, and I don't know if they were the design documents or the as built documents, the pipe that they were looking for was 100 feet away from indications uh, they had of where the pipe was. So, you know, I'm getting this picture in my mind that uh, nobody really has a clue as to how the plant conforms to design and how the as built conforms to the design. And, and I guess I want to know what you know what percentage or, or you know how how much of the pile of design documentation is there. I, I, I won't speculate on either one of those, but I will assure you that we do have a, a clue we have beyond what the plan was built and designed to and again using uh, the industry expertise out there to know not only Correct efficiencies, but to make it easily retrievable that this is much of what the projects can do for us so that we can make the right decisions and make better decisions. I don't have a percentage for right now. I don't have a linear feet of uh, paper. Um, as we progress this area moving forward, especially post restart, we'll be able to give you uh, frequent updates on that and what that looks like because it's an important project for us. It's a fundamental piece of what we're looking at. I would like to talk about the containment internal structure with respect to the as-built design and the design proper. We did find one being where the rebar that was supposed to be on the top was on the bottom, rebar that was supposed to be on the bottom was on the top. That is in our calculations. We also, in the December 12th meeting, Megan Williams from the Region, NR4, region 4 office asked us if we could use techniques to validate other areas that were suspect uh, for the rebar configuration. We used a ground penetrating radar to validate the rebar configuration, and we know the configuration of the rebar in the container. Additionally, 
in my presentation tonight, you did talk about the structural lock-ins that we did on the safety-related systems, and we did not find any major discrepancies. We did use design documents and lock those down thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I'll be sure to get back to you. Okay. I guess I didn't really understand the critical importance of them. Uh, 
uh, a few late weeks uh, uh, or days after uh, I kind of understood what they were. Uh, the day one with the Union of Concerned Scientists sent me a report to the NRC that was made by Gary Gates back in the 90s. He was uh, uh, the plant, whatever, general manager. Uh, he was running the plant. And Fort Calhoun had shut down for him. I can't remember if it was three or six days because they had a reading on gauge that they didn't really know what it meant. And they couldn't find the design documents that related to that gauge. So they evidently thought it was safer to shut the plant. Well, they must have found it, obviously, because the plant's operated since then. But that, you know, then I began to ask myself, well, what if they did shut the plant down? And what if what that gauge was saying was, you know, it's about ready to explode or, or you know, something else. And uh, they couldn't find the design documents, so they just let it go. So, you know, it appears to me that they're very, very important. And if I was running that plant today, I'd be able to give some kind of an uh, estimate, I guess, of, of what you feel, what percentage is missing or how many are missing. Um, Arnie Anderson. Uh, with uh, Fairwinds, a uh, nuclear engineer, former whistleblower, uh, he says they're so important that they had a problem with design documents at a plant in Illinois, and rather than spend all the money to re re recreate the design documents, they turned that nuclear plant into a culvert. It was just too expensive to recreate design documents. So. It should be a concern for the public. Much of what I'm saying right now is for the few folks here in the public that uh, need to know about this. Because when generally when I talk design documents to folks that don't know much about this issue, you can just see their eyes blaze over. And then it's a design document. But they're very, very important. And they're very, very expensive to recreate. And I don't think the plant should be running without them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, early on, uh, Mr. Gates had mentioned um, that uh, system, uh, system drift uh, in Oscar Edge, and you guys have asked multiple times about like, what caused them to, to fall, why the 0350 committee got created, and, and, and what happened. You know, why did they head down that road, and why did they place that fall? And so I'm wondering if anybody ever got anything out of those deep dives and what's the institutional drift, that was the word used. And what does that mean? Like what actually happened? Why did the plant get into the zero You know, since the NRC's been so diligent about keeping track of it over these years, and then all of a sudden it has to constitute a zero fifty because it's obviously dangerous. It's the highest oversight in the country. So thank you. So did you guys ever learn anything? Why did the plan get to this point? And did we learn anything about it? You know, why did it go down? Why were these things missed? Why were the design documents not reconstituted? Why was the Teflon seals not done in the 80s when they were sent to the memo? Why was all these things along the way? They had a 20-year upgrade with their license. They had lots of opportunities for the NRC to catch these things over the years. So what happened? Why didn't we really caught? Why did the nuclear power plant get to such a low level? Performance and safety and security and silence not going off. All the rest that we're learning over the I think there are lessons to be learned for, for the NRC. What we do that, they take a look at it see what we do. And at Fort Calhoun Station, one of the things that they did do is they took a look at themselves. We didn't have outside walls all the time, all the understanding. How, why, and what are what we have to address. 
there are other volumes that are dead, and that's just the, 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 the cost. Did I identify there were issues that resulted in the increased oversight that the agency was looking at? Does that help you? So you haven't really published the lessons learned. That's correct. You haven't actually learned the lessons you ever have. I was just sorry. It's been two years. It's been two years since the state of our lesson learned. I'll just have Tony elaborated that uh, the fundamental performance deficiencies, the reasons behind why the degree of the decline in performance occurred, to where uh, they needed the O350 panel, we established the cap. Uh, our team, the inspection team that I led, we looked at those fundamental performance deficiencies, the items in the restart checklist, uh, the reasons why uh, the station <coughs> Our document in the root cause analyses and in our inspection report is documented and reviewed the media uh, that, that lay out the reasons and whether or not we agree with the root causes that they identified for the decline in performance. So if you go to the, uh, the report that we published just this week, or last week, excuse me, uh, you can read a lot about the decline in performance, the reasons why, and what the NRC's assessment is of those values. I think you should extend the deadline on this kind of period that they were mentioning earlier. And I have not have an end tomorrow. That's not a public person saying that. I haven't had a chance to even hear about it. So it's not even a matter of everyone who's saying this. So uh, as an activist, I'd like to get some of my friends to comment on that. I don't have until tomorrow night. I would strongly encourage you to take a quick look at it. So I will. I will have a look at it. Yeah, we should get some of the comments to the contact with those who are asking you. Do you have the power to extend it? We will understand it. Okay. It's the process. They can request the 1991 connection, emergency. It depends on exactly how it's asked. The way this one was requested was for an exigent uh, response. <coughs> we're going to get it on according to the terms of the regulations and what we're requesting. Um, What's the emergency? I, I think it's I exigency. It's not an emergency. Excuse me. I think we need to take control of the meeting. You guys can have a special after a few days. We just, if anybody else has questions. Okay, we all have any other questions or comments? We have an RCO PPD. Okay, now I'd like to remind everyone that you have the public feedback forms on the table. Please take some time to fill out. Again, I'll see you all around after the meeting if you have any additional questions. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Have a good night.